Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the late start. Uh, we had a hard time getting the Zoom to work, but uh, it uh, seems to be working now. And today we're going to continue our discussion of auctions and market design. Um, I did uh, just this morning, my morning, bright and early, I um, worked on the uh, course webpage a little bit. And there, this is unusual in that the, my, the webpage is my webpage. So you just uh, go to, uh, just Google Crampton, uh, spelled without a P, and then uh, the top choice will probably be my website. And then click on, uh, uh, under courses, click on auctions and market design. And that will have the, um, uh, it'll have the lectures, it'll have the slides. The slides aren't yet posted. Um, it probably will take about um, five hours after the class for me to post the, um, the lecture. I, I'll I'm still working on the slides, so they'll be posted uh, maybe later today, but if not, um, sometime on uh, Wednesday. Uh, so they will get posted and then there's readings. Um, and so all the readings will be there, both um, the mandatory ones and then the recommended ones. And there's quite a long list. I think most everything except for the books is available uh, just by clicking on my webpage, the, the link. Um, so that should be nice. And let's see, what else? Um, yeah, so the plan is I'm gonna do the first four lectures. This is the second of the first four. And then we're very fortunate to have Dirk Bergman, um, who's done some of the most exciting theoretical work in auctions in the last 10 years, um, who will be presenting the next three lectures. And then uh, I will return uh, for the, the final three lectures. And then I'll focus on applications, um, a number of market design applications that involve auctions. So, but today it's going to be uh, a little bit more introductory material. Um, some of you have seen at least a version of this material in my lecture uh, in economic engineering uh, a week and a half ago. And so that should be fine. This will just be, you know, repetition for effect. And, and uh, I hope that it won't be too painful. I'll try to go th through things as quickly as I can, but I know that uh, many of you haven't uh, uh, seen the uh, economic engineering lectures. So, so anyway, that's, that's the plan. Um, I should say that the, the main textbook for the course is BJ Krishna's auction theory, uh, second edition. And that is, I'm not going to go through and, and, and cover the chapters in any detail. I'll be covering the material of many of the chapters, not all of the chapters, but many of the chapters, and uh, Dirk will be as well. But the, you'll see more uh, of this in the, more of the textbook in the exercises and the problem sets. So just to uh, be clear about that. Now, last time we finished up, we were talking, looking at the standard auctions for auctioning a single item. And we were all very familiar with uh, the Sotheby's and Christie's English auction format, the uh, Dutch auction format used in uh, the Netherlands for tulips and also used for in fish, commonly used in fish markets uh, for fresh fish. And then there's the uh, sealed bid versions, the first price auction, which is most like the Dutch auction and the second price auction, which is most like the English auction. So now let me just very quickly talk about um, behavior in these auctions. And I'll start with the English, which is the easiest. The English is a wonderful auction in that it is quite transparent what the, uh, best strategy is. Um, you simply want to bid up to your valuation. So if you've got a valuation of 
a hundred euros, then you should stay in the auction until the price reaches a hundred euros. And at that point you should drop out. Now, hopefully everybody else dropped out and ideally at some low price like 60 euros, and then you would be the winner at 60 euros. Um, the um, bidding up to your value is a dominant strategy, uh, which means not that it's just a, a really good strategy. It means that it's uh, um, the best strategy regardless of what the others are doing. So no matter what strategy the others are pursuing, you still wanna bid up to your value. Uh, and that's sort of our strongest equilibrium concept. Uh, lots of games don't have dominant strategy equilibria, but when they do, it's very nice. And it's especially nice in this uh, English auction format because the dominant strategy is quite obvious to everyone. So when we do lab experiments with the English auction, we get virtually everybody uh, playing that dominant strategy, bidding up to their value. So that's very nice. Um, the second price auction is the seal bid implementation of the English auction. It's not uh, strategically identical because there's actually a lot more information that can, gets conveyed in an English auction. But the second price auction is uh, very useful in instances where it's not possible to do a dynamic auction. Um, and the, the way it works, it was proposed by William Vickery, uh, the way it works is uh, just like a seal, uh, seal bid first price auction, everybody reports their values um, or reports their bids, puts them in an envelope, the envelopes are opened up, the, they're sorted highest to lowest, uh, the highest bid wins, and pays the second highest price. Uh, and it might seem odd at first, you know, why the second highest price? And the reason is, well, because that's what uh, implements the English auction uh, effectively. When we think about the English auction, if everybody is bidding up to their uh, value, so my value is 100 euros, I bid up to my um, value of 100 euros, unless it stops sooner, well, suppose that the second highest is 90 euros. Well, in that case, the, uh, the second to last person is gonna drop out at when 90 euros is reached and then I'll be the only one with my hand up and I will win at 90 euros. So in the second price auction, uh, we open the envelopes up. There's one that's got 100, that's me, I'm the winner. There's this, the second highest at 90 and I pay the second highest price uh, of 90. And what that does is it gives me the right incentives to truthfully report my value of 100. And that was the genius of uh, Vickery when he suggested it in his famous uh, 1961 paper that got him the Nobel Prize. Um, so just thinking about why, in fact, it, it's a dominant strategy for me to um, bid my value in the second price auction, uh, just recognize that, I mean, the, the proof actually is very simple. We just consider, uh, you know, suppose I have a value of 100. Um, well, there's two things that I that sort of consider three strategies. One, bidding 100. I claim that's the dominant strategy. Well, let's see what happens if I bid more or if I bid less. Those are the only three possibilities. So if I show that bidding more is, is worse than, uh, or, or at least no better than bidding 100, and the same thing is true for bidding less, then I'm done. I've proven that in fact, bidding my value, which happens to be 100, is my best strategy. So let's reason through this. Uh, and it's very straightforward. So what if I bid, instead of 100, I bid uh, 110? Um, what happens? Well, and this is gonna be true for anything that's bigger than my value. Uh, I'm just using numbers in case that's uh, helpful for you. Um, so by bidding 110, what happens? Well, I will win all those cases that I would win if I'd bid 100. And that's great. Uh, um, so, so, in, you know, so far it's doing just as well. But now, in addition, the difference is 
I'm now going to win all those cases where the second highest happens to be between 100 and 110. In each of those cases, I might think, well, gee, that's great, I win more. But in each of those cases, I end up paying a price that's higher than my value of 100. So I've done worse. I, I increase uh, the cases, I expand the cases that I win, but in all of the expansion, I actually lose money. So I don't wanna do that. So I don't wanna bid too high. Well, maybe I wanna bid too low. Maybe 90 is what I wanna do. Well, if I was to bid 90, what would happen? Well, then I would uh, get the same thing as by bidding 100, except in those instances when the second highest happens to fall between 90 and 100. And in each of those instances, instead of winning at a profitable price that's less than 100, I'd end up losing. And so again, uh, now, in this case, I've reduced the circumstances under which I went, win, but I've done it in, in a, a bad way. All, each of those cases where I now lose, where I would win with a bit of 100, I actually would have preferred to have won because I would have won at a profitable price. And so, therefore, bidding 100 is the best strategy. I don't want to bid above. I don't want to bid below. It's a dominant strategy argument that I just gave because I didn't say anything about the behavior of the others. I just considered the possibility that the second highest might be above or below 100. And of course, that includes all possibilities. Um, so uh, that's why it's a, a dominant strategy. And that's a you know, full legitimate proof, which uh, is outlined in, in the slides. And I won't go through it because I just articulated it without pictures. Okay. Um, this is very nice. It is not quite as transparent as in the English auction. And so in the laboratory, um, most people figure out that they should bid their value, but lots of people don't. Uh, there tends to be a little bit of overbidding. So if anything, there's um, yeah, some small amount that, that they bid more than their value. And often it works out just fine. Um, you know, lots of times you could, you could uh, you know, let's say the thing was worth $100 to you. You could bid $10 million and you might be lucky and have no one else bid $10 million. You'd surely win, but, um, and you might be lucky that the second highest turns out to be 60. And then he's like, oh, this is great. But such a bid would be very dangerous. Uh, so you wouldn't want to do it. But actually in the laboratory, we sometimes see that. People that, that think, well, okay, well, I'm not going to have to pay my bid so I can make it anything. And, and in fact, if you that works fine if you're the only one. But if there's two people that adopt that strategy, it's a complete disaster for the winner. So not, not a very good thing at all. <clears throat> okay, well, so that was the English and, and the second price. Now let's think about the first price. How do you want to bid in the first price? Well, the first price is uh, when you extend it to multiple units is uh, called the pay as bid auction. And uh, because you pay what you bid. So, so everybody puts in a bid and we open the envelopes, highest bid wins and they pay their, their winning bid. This is the one that seems the most natural. Uh, so it's very easy to explain, very simple rules. And the only thing is the strategy is difficult. Because when you think about it, um, you certainly don't want to bid your value. Um, you're bidding your value, you would, you would end up getting zero uh, in the event that you win. And you get zero in the event you lose, so you always get zero. And so that doesn't seem like a very effective strategy. What you want to do is shade your bid, bid less than your, your true value. And by doing that, then you... Um, can make some money. How much did you shade? Well, you're just doing this uh, complicated trade-off between the probability of winning. The less, the, the more you shade, the probability of winning falls. The more you shade, the larger the profit that you make, conditional on winning. And you want to balance the product of those two things. That's your expected profit. Um, the probability of winning times the profit that I get conditional on winning. So I want to maximize that profit. And 
as is often the case when you're maximizing a product of two things where, the, where they trade each other off, you want to balance uh, those two uh, things. And uh, we will do that formally in just a moment. And the, typically the way you do it is you write down the, the optimization problem and then uh, take the derivative, set the derivative equal to zero. Uh, that's the first order condition for an optimum. And that will be a differential equation. And then you solve that differential equation to identify the bidding strategy. And if you've got uh, n bidders in uh, with asymmetric valuations, then you would have a, uh, uh, a system of n differential equations that you need to solve simultaneously. And that would be very difficult. So we typically aren't going to do too much of that. But when we assume symmetry, then things can be much simpler, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, so that is the first price or the pay as bid auction. And the, um, one of the interesting things is when we think about that trade-off, um, intuitively what you'd want to do is bid just enough to beat the second highest. So in fact, what happens in this is you actually bid the expected value of the second highest. When you're, if you were to be, if you were risk neutral, um, and that's very interesting because what happens in the English and Dutch auction is that ex post the winner pays the second highest value, and so in expectation they the winner pays the uh, expected second highest, and that's the revenue collected by the seller. And intuitively, the same thing's going to happen in the first price auction in expectation, and it does. Um, and so that's, uh, that's very interesting. And it turns out that's, that's actually a, a famous revenue equivalence theorem, which was also proven by Vickery in his famous 1961 paper. You know, here he was decades ahead of the profession in doing this very important analysis in games of incomplete information at a time where games of incomplete information, the theory wasn't yet even worked out by Hersani, which didn't happen until the late 60s. Um, so this was uh, quite remarkable. And not only did he do it for a single item, he did it for multiple items. So, which was really amazing uh, because the multi-item literature really wasn't developed until the end of the 60s and then really not uh, fully until the uh, 1990s. So, uh, you know, very, very interesting, quite uh, amazing. <clears throat> so now the, let's think about the Dutch auction. So in the Dutch auction, similar to the first price auction, it's pretty clear. So Dutch auction, we're starting at a very high price and we're dropping that price until somebody says, I'll take it. And the reason that we use that in Holland for flower auctions and in fish markets around the world is because it's extremely fast. So if you're selling a whole bunch of things and you've got the people in the room, the fastest auction format informationally, at least before computers, is the, uh, the Dutch and is, is the Dutch auction because in, in essence, you don't have to sort any numbers. You just have to find somebody that's that raises their hand or, or touches their nose or whatever, pulls their ear, you know, whatever indication they want to do that, that they will take it. Um, and so it's especially well suited for things that need to be viewed like flowers and fish and are highly perishable. So you want to get this stuff sold quickly. Um, and, and, and that's why that institution uh, came up. Now, thinking of the incentives, um, so once, you know, let's continue with my value being 100 euros, when, so, so the, it's at 200 euros, I'm not at all interested, 150, not interested, 130, 120, 110, it gets down to 100, and I don't want to just go, I'll take it, because I make zero, just like in the first price sealed bid auction. I want to wait, and I wait until 
um, you know, as I wait, it goes down 97, 96, 95. Um, and as it goes down, I'm thinking, oh, okay, now I'm making money. Well, I wonder how long I should wait. And it gets down you know, 190 and I'm starting to sweat a little bit, get kind of nervous. Um, but maybe I hang in there a little bit longer and then I raise my hand at 185, at, at 85. And, um, but of course, somebody could raise their hand first and then I would be really upset. I would regret what just happened. And that is uh, the exact same tension that one has in the first price auction, the sealed bid version. And in fact, uh, the two are often described as being strate strategically equivalent. That is, all I'm doing in both is looking at my value, uh, evaluating that trade-off between the uh, probability of winning and the profit that I get conditional on winning, maximizing that profit, and, and just balancing that trade-off perfectly is what I want to do in both. So it's the exact same trade-off, the same mathematically, it's identical. Behaviorally, it's a little bit different. Um, and experimentally, the Dutch auction raises a little bit more revenue than the first price sealed bid auction. And one explanation is that the, um, it's easier for the bidders to anticipate the regret that they will feel when they've got a value of 100 and somebody sneaks in at 90. And then they go, oh, geez, darn it. Because they're constantly being, um, that, that, that trade-off, you know, the, the fact there's that spread and I'm not moving and I'm just really nervous uh, is going to make that uh, loser's regret more salient and that has been shown to affect behavior and practice. So that's what we see. Uh, you know, another theory is that the, uh, you can see in the facial expressions or the sweat or whatever, um, when somebody is, um, when the price has fallen below somebody's value and that causes a, a trigger reaction a, a little bit sooner. And that is, Certainly possible, but for me, it's the salient, the salience of the regret in the Dutch auction that makes it perform uh, a little bit better in terms of revenues for the seller. Okay, um, and in this, of course, if it's the you know theoretically, it's going to achieve the same outcome as the first price auction. So it too will be, um, in the simplest case, will yield the same revenues as the first price which yields the same revenues to second price, which yields the same revenues of, as the, uh, the English auction. And that is the famous revenue equivalence theorem. Uh, it turns out, here's one statement of it. There's many statements. One statement is all the standard auctions yield the same uh, expected revenue. Another version, which, you know, that was a casual statement. It's actually completely false, uh, as I said it, because there's all these qualifications that you have to, to make. Um, and, and same with this one. This one's a little bit, you know, I have to state fewer qualifications, but there still are definitely some. And so it said it's uh, all auction protocols with a property that the winner with the highest value wins and bidders with the lowest possible value make zero lead to the same expected revenue to the seller. So that's a more general statement. And that's gonna be true with uh, actually fewer assumptions. The two things that I need are um, independence um, and I need, uh, let's see, uh, uh, quasi-linear utility. So I need risk neutrality and independence are the two things that are going to lead to this as a, as a uh, theorem. Um, so our private information needs to be independent. Um, and then this uh, statement holds. And now notice that all the standard auctions, uh, if you've got a value of zero, you're going to get zero. And so um, you know that could be the lowest possible type. 
And then the lowest types get zero. So in all the standard auctions and uh, in all the standard auctions, if we assume symmetry uh, in addition to the other assumptions, then the high, high value, the, the bidder with the highest value wins. Okay, in the English and the second price, that's true irrespective of symmetry. But for the Dutch and the, Eng and the uh, first price, I need symmetry in order to guarantee that the highest value are wins. Uh, so that's some of the assumptions that one needs. So uh, yeah, so in, in, in general, I need single item, risk neutrality, independence, and symmetry. Uh, for that full and but actually, I don't actually need um, symmetry. I still need a single item for that statement from the prior page. But what we will we'll look at the case of multi units and see that there is a very strong revenue equivalence theorem that's quite similar, uh, and we will prove that very generally. And we'll prove that, in fact, the critical assumptions here are the risk neutrality and, and independence uh, that is important. So, like all theorems, um, the assumptions of the theorem need to hold for the theorem to be true, and the assumptions typically do not hold. Um, and in this case, you know, none of those assumptions would hold in practice. Uh, they're pretty much all violated. So that doesn't mean the revenue equivalence theorem is not important. It's actually incredibly useful, powerful technique coming from mechanism design that uh, we will use all the time as sort of our first line of attack when solving auction problems. And uh, so it's, you know, lots of very nice results have come from the revenue equivalence theorem. Um, so I don't mean to diminish it at all, but I do want to point out that, in fact, this whole issue of, you know, like what's the best auction in terms of revenues is actually a very interesting practical problem. And it's not the case that all auctions yield the same revenues, they, you know, far from it. Um, only in very, very special circumstances is that the case. Otherwise, uh, if revenue is one of your objectives, then the uh, there's typically a lot that the auction designer can say. <clears throat> so, uh, as I mentioned, this was uh, the famous work of William Vickery, who got the Nobel Prize in 96 for this wonderful work. And unfortunately, he died uh, right after, uh, well, about a week after the announcement of the prize. And so that was terrible, he wasn't able to accept the prize on December 10th in Stockholm. And so instead, and give his uh, Nobel lecture, so instead Paul Milgram uh, gave the lecture and that was uh, very nice. And, and interestingly, Paul uh, Milgram gave a lecture about a innovative auction idea that we have and had with uh, that, that he had uh, in the United States way back around 2000. Um, but it ultimately got implemented just a few years ago. And in fact, uh, in two days, we'll start the uh, a large version of that auction. And that auction is to encourage uh, rural broadband in the United States in areas where it's not economic by itself. And so what the government's doing to promote rural broadband uh, you know, for people that, that otherwise wouldn't have any service, um, the government is contributing $16 billion and uh, allocating subsidies to get as much. And so the auction actually is identifying uh, who will be providing that service and receive the subsidy what the subsidy will be. And the goal of the auction is to maximize uh, the amount of rural broadband coverage that can be achieved of high quality for that $16 billion budget. Uh, so that's very nice. And that's starting in a couple days. 
Um, so, and it's probably, I think it'll only take uh, two weeks. So it'll be a fairly fast auction, but it's an auction. Talk about auctions involving many items. It, it involves many, many, uh, ten, many tens of thousands of items uh, sold simultaneously in a descending clock. We're allocating subsidies. So we start at a very high price. The price lowers until there's in, in, until essentially only one person is bidding on each of the um, locations that end up being served uh, and the clearing condition is satisfied. Uh, that is the FCC, the regulator isn't spending more than $16 billion. So that's a little, little aside, but um, I, it was connected to uh, William Vickery and his revenue equivalents theorem. <laughs> okay, here's just a simple example um, that if you had full information, then it's sort of obvious that this is, uh, that you're gonna get the same prices, the same expected revenue. Um, so with the English auction, you know, let's say the highest is 15, the lowest is 10, then the price is gonna to drop to 10. So the high guy wins at a price of 10. In the second price auction, uh, the same thing happens, obviously. So same revenue, same outcome. In the first price auction, you know, in this case, you actually get the exact same um, price as well because a is going to think, okay, I know you've got a value of 10, so I'm going to have to outbid you, and that's 10 plus a, a penny. And so you get the, the same thing, and, and of course with the Dutch as well. So that's with full information. In auctions, where we recognize that the bidders don't have full information, except for in ex exceptional circumstances. And so a big part of our modeling task is to model the game with incomplete information. And when we do that, then we still get this expected result when the, with independence and risk neutrality, but it's no longer the case that the different standard auctions are outcome equivalent. In fact, the outcomes are, uh, in, with symmetry, the outcome, the allocation is the same, but the pricing is different. And in the, uh, second price and English auction, the ex post realization is the second price. Um, but in the um, first price and Dutch auctions, it's the expected second price. So the winner is the guy with the highest value and he's paying the expected second highest price, which, which basically reduces the price variation um, that you see in the English and Dutch auctions. So that's one thing that the first price and Dutch auction have going for them is that there's less price variation. That's the positive. The negative is the strategy is much more complex and the efficiency result only holds in the very, very special case of symmetry. Uh, in practice, there's almost inevitably ex ante uh, asymmetries among the bidders. And so in, that, in, in all those cases, then efficiency is um, not achieved by the, the first or the Dutch auction. Uh, okay, we're gonna come back and talk more about that later. Now, the optimal auction, um, we're going to talk about in greater detail later as well, but just very briefly right now, essentially what the seller wants to do to increase revenues is not just, you know, throw up their hands and say, oh, it doesn't make any difference. They're all, all the standard auctions do just as well. In fact, you can do better than the standard auctions by introducing a reserve price. And so that's what uh, one needs to do in order to, um, maximize revenue. So if that was really your goal to maximize revenues in this particular auction with a fixed set of bidders, then what you would do is set the uh, set a reserve price above your, uh, your value as seller. Um, and that reserve price would 
provide an, a very important role. And in fact, we see reserve prices in, in almost all auctions, um, a reserve price is set. Um, sometimes the reserve price is very low, like zero. Um, and that's designed strategically by the market maker to encourage participation. Um, because one thing this reserve price does is discourage participation. Uh, if you've got a value that's below the reserve price, then you're not going to participate. Um, and it also harms efficiency. If, you, if, if the highest valuer has a value below the reserve price, no trade will take place, even if the, um, this value is a, well above the seller's uh, value. So, you know, that's the downside of reserve prices. Um, and there's now, uh, I'll talk a little bit about some work that uh, Dirk and I are doing um, together with Axel Ockenfels and, and others. And they, um, that's gonna look at how we can um, actually improve things by not using a hard reserve price, but by in fact using a, uh, what we call a soft reserve. But I won't talk about that now. I'll talk about, about that uh, a bit later in, in the course. And that's ongoing research right now, but uh, it seems to be very useful in practice. <laughs> And in fact, I want to use in, in all the standard auctions, I would want to adopt the exact same reserve uh, in the optimal auction. Uh, and so all of the standard auctions can achieve the optimal um, revenues with the optimal reserve. <clears throat> okay, now let's, uh, it'll be fun to actually uh, do a real auction. So I have this jar of coins which I want to auction off. Um, and I'm going to auction it off with the, the various standard auctions that we have used. So I am going to auction this jar of coins um, using a first price sealed bid, a second price auction, and then the modern version of an English auction, which is the uh, ascending clock. Now, those that took the economic engineering class You've already seen this because we did this in, in that class. And so I'd prefer it if you would uh, uh, not participate in this, um, but everybody else should participate. And the way to participate, we're gonna use, first I'm gonna collect your estimates. So what you should be doing as I talk is try to estimate. So these are uh, you know, totally legitimate photographs of the, oh, oh actually, let me get the pointer here. Uh, and a spotlight. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so these coins, they're uh, they're all cents, um, and uh, it's the same jar. It's just two pictures, so you could see it at different angles. So, what you should be doing first is estimating. Uh, how many coins are in the jar, because that's going to be the value. You won't actually get the coin, the jar of coins, you'll get the monetary equivalent. Um, so for example, I've thought long and hard about this, and I came up with an estimate of 525. So that's, if there were 525 coins in the jar, then that's exactly um, what I would get for winning. 525 cents or five euros and 25 cents, but all the bids are going to be in cents. <clears throat> and so what I would do, uh, what, what you would do is I would go into chat and I would just enter this. So E equals 525. That's my estimate. And then I, on the same line, I do comma and then first price is going to be my bid in a first price auction. And now here at first price, I've got to think, right? Okay, this is a complicated trade-off. I've got to solve a differential equation. I've got to figure out how many bidders there are. Um, and so um, I'm going to want to shade my bid. I definitely don't want to bid 525. I want to bid less. What should I do? I don't know. Um, but let me quickly solve the differential equation. And I'm in bidding uh, 494. And then finally, second price, 
um, now, okay, what do I want to do? Uh, second price has got the same incentives as the English auction, pretty much. Um, I want to uh, bid my value. Okay, so I'll just put 525 and then I hit enter to send it. Now everybody should be able to see the chat. So what you want to do is you don't want to send it to everybody. You want to go in and switch to uh, Emanuele. So we're going to send all, we're going to send a direct message to Emanuele. Okay. And Emanuele is going to be the bid taker and then determine, um, look at the estimates, determine the winner in the first price, determine the winner in the second price. Okay, so everybody should be sending a message like the one that I just sent, which was this, um, but it should be sent to Emanuele. Okay. If you could just tell me the number of bids that you received. Sixteen. Sixteen beads. Sixteen, okay. And does that include the I know one actually, yeah, one came in over the everyone chat rather than mm -hmm. directly to you, but you probably got that one too. Yeah. Okay, good. Sixteen. Okay, so that's great. And now what we're gonna do is an ascending auction. So before, so while I'm doing an ascending auction, uh, if you, Emmanuel, I could identify the uh, the winner in the first price auction, the price that they pay, which is their bid, and their estimate, and the same thing for the second price auction. So identify mm -hmm. the, the winner, the second highest, uh, which will yep. be the price, and the estimate of the winner in the second highest. Okay. And then also identify the highest estimate overall. Mm -hmm. And But now what we're going to do is an ascending clock auction. And so this one... Um, so, so uh, you know, again, just the 16 that uh, weren't in economic engineering will participate and we will um, start at a low price and uh, I'm going to start at, uh, uh, let me start at 200 uh, and then we're going to go up from 200 uh, and then what you should do, the way you indicate that you're in is by uh, the green so if you go into participants, so everybody should click on participants. So you see the list of participants. And then at the bottom of the participant uh, window is a green yes checkbox. And if you're happy with the 200 price, then you should uh, click that check. So if you're in at 200, then click the, uh, the green. Okay, 200 is a really nice price. So everybody should be clicking green. Not, well, the 16 or so, I think. You certainly don't have to. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna raise the price. And as I raise the price, uh, all you do is just uh, click no when you see how mine turned to uh, red. Okay, so you just start out like that with green, but then click, uh, click no when you're out. Now I'm gonna uh, shut mine off because I don't wanna be counted. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm auctioning. Okay, so we're at, we're at 200. Um, 220, 240, 520, 540, 560, 580. Okay, so, so both went out at 580. So 560 is the price that will be the second highest. And let's see, the last, 
Um, uh, uh, Maritz, I think that you were the last one that I saw drop out. So Maritz is the winner and it was at 560. Congratulations, you won uh, a jar of coins uh, or the amount of value in the jar of coins. And now let me tell you how many coins that I actually know how many coins there are in the, in the jar. There are 300. So congratulations, you're a winner, but the bad news is you actually lost uh, some money, but not too much, just a couple of euros. Okay, so that is the uh, English ascendant, the ascending clock auction. Now, if we did it in, in practice, you know, for real high stakes, you, you, you saw that we had these dropouts and um, we went from 560 to 580 and two people dropped out in that range. And so what we do in practice is I ask uh, the bidders to say exactly the uh, price point at which they're exiting when they exit. So two people are in at 560 and then uh, you know somebody submits an exit bid of 565 and Maritz sits an exit bid of uh, 575. And so Maritz is the winner and pays 565. So we get, so we make price continuous, even though we have discrete rounds in practice. And that's the way we've been doing it for over 20 years. Um, and it works incredibly well. So, um, and you, you need to have discrete rounds in, um, in general, but using the internet technology because the uh, continuous time just doesn't work uh, perfectly uh, with internet technology. It doesn't work at perfectly actually with any technology. Uh, and this is actually a huge issue when we talk about financial markets um, because they, they're, they're pretending that there's continuous time, but continuous time is just a figment of the, um, the, the, you know, the auctioneer's imagination. It doesn't actually exist. Uh, in our real world. Everything is discrete. Okay, so now let me ask Emanuele. Um, you know, first of all, what was the highest estimate? So the highest estimate is uh, 730. 730, good. Mm -hmm. And the first price winner, uh, what was their estimate? So the first price winner had an estimate of 610. 610, and their bid in the first price auction? And their bid was 69. 609. 609. Oh, okay, good. And then in the second price auction, the high bidder? The high bidder in the second price auction had an estimate of 624 and bid 624. Okay. And, and, and the, the second, second the, Second highest had an estimate of 610 and bid 610. Okay. So in the first price, we have an outcome with a price of 709, uh, 609. And in the second price, we have uh, an outcome with a price of uh, 610. That's pretty close to the revenue equivalent uh, <laughs> yes. between those two. I don't think I've ever had it that close. <laughs> And then of course we had the 560 outcome in the English auction, the ascending clock. Um, so as you can see, we didn't get revenue equivalents. We got the, the revenues were pretty close, but the remarkable thing about this is, boy, these auctions were amazing in terms of revenue because let me tell you how many coins are in the jar, 300. So I basically just auctioned to uh, brilliant graduate students a jar of coins that contained 300 coins for 560 in the second price auction, in the English auction, 610 in the second price and 609 in the first price. So I made money hand over fist. I, I effectively doubled my money uh, every time I sold this, uh, which is great, uh, great for me. And also great for learning too, because it illustrates a very important phenomenon that William Vickery did not discover and did not study, and that's called the winner's curse. The winner's curse is the fact that when people are bidding for things and the value is uncertain, there is a strong tendency 
for the person that overestimates the most to win uh, the item and actually pay a price that's well above value. And that's why it's called the winner's curse. Um, so this is a very pervasive phenomenon. It's seen all the time in uh, laboratory experiments. It's seen in practice until the, the bidders gain experience. And the bidders do gain experience. Sometimes it takes a very long time. In the lab, you can, you can run uh, this experiment you know, 20 times and the, they gradually learn the winner's curse, but it takes a, a long time. And how long it takes is very much a function of the information feedbacks. But with good feedback, you, 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 if you work really hard, you know, after a long time, you can get the winner's curse to go away. Um, but it takes a long time. In the real world, uh, same thing. Winner's curse happens all the time. Uh, it's even when the stakes are very high. In the early decades of uh, auctions for oil tracks, you know, there it's something that's highly uncertain. People are, are uh, uh, Exxon and Shell and others are estimating how much oil is in the ground. The value to them is roughly the same based upon how much oil is in the ground um, and what the world price of oil is going to be over the next um, five to 10 years or whatever the, lice of the, the length of the lease is. So, um, you know, this, this is definitely real. And in fact, the, the winner's curse was first identified in the oil track auctions when people started to notice that they were losing money. Year after year, they would lose money in their oil bids and have to make up for it in, uh, say, retail distribution and refinery. But the, uh, they actually lost money on the uh, oil track bidding for decades. And so this was recorded. You know, some people did some practical empirical work, uh, documented this, and um, then the, the market participants sort of got it and said, okay, now we understand it, that we're, we're bidding too aggressively, we've got to change our strategies. And so this came up for me when I was a, uh, 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 I, I did a, a work study thing when I was an undergraduate at the research park in Exxon's research park in New Jersey. And I was very interested in auctions and the, um, uh, and 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 I they I, I asked them you know what well what's your strategy and they said well we we look to see how much oil's in the ground and then we bid ten cents on the dollar and that's very interesting because that ten cents on the dollar that 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 you know bidding uh, a fraction of what you estimate it actually turns out that the equilibrium strategy uh, takes that form when bidder's values are log normally distributed. Um, bidder's a, a values or their estimates are log normally distributed. And that turns out to be empirically the case for these uh, oil tracks. Um, so it's, you know, it's sort of interesting that they stumbled upon the equilibrium strategy without actually uh, you know, just for from decades of experience, uh, gradually learning that when they bid higher, they lose money. And that's, you know, that's sort of interesting. Um, th that's often the way it, it, things happen. You know, people learn how to bid over time. It takes, takes a while. Uh, I know I had a, a good friend that was a, a electrical contractor. And he had a rule that uh, if he was looking at a job uh, to bid on, he, he would evaluate, you know, take a look at the a quick look at the job, see how many people were interested in it. If there were more, four or more people bidding on the job, he wouldn't bid. Because what he found was anytime there were four or more people and, they, and he won the job, he would end up losing money, that there'd be something that he misestimated and, and it would end up costing more than, uh, or somebody's bidding uh, too aggressively and they just lose money. 
Now, you know, in, the, in this context, um, you you might want to think, well, well, what if I think that you know, like I totally understand the winner's curse, but I can't count on my classmates to understand it. How should I bid? Well, the answer is you actually need to bid much more conservatively than you would otherwise. And in fact, there's it's hopeless to win. You know, with 16 bidders in a classroom experiment like this, it's hopeless. You're not going to make money. Your your best bid is actually not bidding at all. And that is quite different from the private value environment that Vickery studied. So the big thing here, the big difference is that unlike Vickery, where each bidder has a value and knows what their value is and the value doesn't depend upon anybody else, in this context, we don't, no one knows the value. We have to estimate the, estimate the value. And um, in fact, the information that other people have is relevant to how I would value the good. If I knew the estimates of the others, that would be informative about um, the value of the good. Uh, and in fact, if you take a large class, it's typical that the, um, uh, the average estimate will be very close to true value. So for example, on the next slide here, it shows this is a distribution from one large class in Cologne, an undergraduate class for that same jar of coins. And you can see that the uh, average is about 300. So it's, you know, it's, it's pretty darn close. Uh, we're over 300 and the reason for that is I used what's called framing. So I framed the, uh, the, the setting with my example and um, that caused your uh, estimates to be biased high. Uh, and I'm sure, Emmanuel, if you average the 16 estimates, it's gonna be well over 300. And I think that's because, that's sort of the power of framing. Framing really matters. And, you know, it shouldn't, but it does. Um, I was actually doing it because I'm curious to see. Okay, yeah, you do it, you tell <laughs> so us. I let you know. know. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, so, but, you know, the highest bid was very similar to what, what we had in this class. Um, and so this is a, you know, it's just your typical distribution. Um, so what do you want to do in this? Well, do we just have to throw out everything we learned from Vickery? And the answer is no. In fact, um, most everything Vickery said carries forward, but we have to, um, we have to uh, do one very important thing. And that is, we, we have to uh, condition our estimate on the bad news that winning conveys. Uh, that's the way to think about it. That in fact, the highest estimate, so here's the highest estimate, 1150, which is about the same as in this class. And, and in, in all the three auctions, the winner had an estimate that was way up here, you know, way above uh, the average. And so uh, when you learn that you win, it's actually bad news about your estimate. Since your bid only matters in the event that you win, you want to condition on that event. And uh, so you're conditioning on the bad news winning conveys. And that means you want to shade your bid a lot more. Um, so for example, if we had uh, estimates that were say normally distributed, then what you'd want to do is 16 bids. That means the highest of 16 uh, draws that are centered on uh, a normal mean with a, a particular standard deviation, uh, the highest of 16 draws from that normal distribution is biased by uh, well more than a standard deviation. So I, you know, I'm not sure exactly how much, 1.2 standard deviations or something like that. It's easy to calculate. Um, and so you would have to uh, discount your bid by at least 1.2 standard deviations. And that's exactly what you'd want to do in the second price and the English auction. 
Well, in the second price auction, you, you, would, you, you would discount by let's say 1.2 standard deviations. And so you're bidding your expected value conditional on winning. In the ascending clock auction, you have additional information because you get to see where the others are dropping out. And so now you can condition a lot more information and um, you, you know, so whether you 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 drop, whether you uh, reduce by one point two or one point three or one point one, it'll depend upon the exact dropout points of the others. But you will have that uh, that same uh, sort of conditioning. And then in the first price auction, you want to shade even more beyond that. So in the first price auction, you wanna bid 1.5 standard deviations or 1.7 standard deviations, something like that. And with a normal distribution, that actually is the optimal bidding strategy in, um, in, in both first price and second price. Second price, you want to just, um, it's gonna be some number of standard deviations that's the bias, conditional on winning, and you wanna subtract that. In English, you wanna do that plus a little bit more. Uh, because you want to make money, um, and that takes the that's the uh, the form of the equilibrium bidding strategy in with a normal distribution. And as I said, the log normal distribution you want to bid a percentage of your uh, estimate uh, is the optimal strategy, <clears throat> and you solve it by uh, uh, solving uh, di a differential equation essentially in the first price. In the second price, it's just a first order statistic. Uh, so you just look up at the, or, or ask Mathematic or, or any tool that you want, what the first order statistic uh, is for the, uh, the highest of 16 estimates uh, from whatever distribution you think you have. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let's do one more trading situation. This won't be an auction. This will this will be a, a negotiation between buyer and seller of a car. I've got a car and I want to sell it to you. And uh, here's the car. It's a nice, beautiful German car. Okay, it is a diesel. And yes, it uh, it has the whatever it's called the device. Um, uh, you know, it knows when to. Uh, turn on and off the uh, pollution control, this particular uh, model, uh, which hopefully is off the road now. But um, you're, uh, you estimate that this car is worth between zero and 12,000. <clears> and you don't know, um, all those are equally likely, uh, let's say. And um, what you do know is that the car is worth less to me than it is to you. So you're the buyer, you know it's worth more to you than it is to me because um, I'm going to accept any offer that is two thirds of the value. You know, I really, I'm moving, I don't, I, I can't use this car. And so I'd have to uh, go out and find another buyer and that's costly to me. So. So here's the situation. The question is, how much do you bid? So a natural thing to do would be to figure out, well, okay, it's worth between zero and 12. So in expectation, it's worth 6,000. Uh, that's great. Um, I know that Peter's going to accept anything up to two thirds. So maybe I could put in a bid of 400 and then uh, uh, make some money. You know, if it turns out it's worth 600, then I'm sorry, 6,000, then a bit of, uh, a bit of 4,000 is going to be acceptable, just barely, and um, and then I'll make 2,000, which would be great. So that'd be really nice. So that might be a reasonable thing to do. Well, turns out that's not a good thing to do. Uh, and the reason is the exact same as the winner's curse. But I just wanted to do this example very quickly to illustrate uh, that the phenomenon is not just in auctions, it's an all trade. Uh, this phenomenon of uh, winning is, uh, you know, trading is bad news about value. Um, and now let's just think about it. So, uh, 
the expected value is 6,000. You might think 4,000 would be a good offer, but in fact, what happens if you make the 4,000 offer? Well, so the, you make the offer 4,000. I will accept as long as, so that's why I got the, the is 4,000 is two thirds of 6,000. And the, uh, um, and, and, and so as a result, the value is between zero and 6,000 conditional on my accepting your 4,000 offer. And therefore this car is worth an expectation 3,000 and you've lost a thousand dollars or euros. Now I've got it right. And so maybe the problem was that you made an offer that was too high. So you screwed up by saying 4,000. So what if you did something less? Um, well, anything that you do less, so let's suppose instead of 4,000, you do, let's do 2,000. So what about 2,000? You know, if you're losing money at four, maybe you'll make money at 2,000. Well then 2,000, then I'm gonna accept as long as the value is no more than 3,000 because I accept everything that's bigger than two thirds of the actual value. So then the, val the value is uniformly distributed between zero and 3,000. The car in expectation is worth one and a half thousand and you just paid 2,000 for it. So again, you lost money in expectation. And in fact, that's true. It doesn't, it's not the case that, well, 2,000 is too high. We could try 1,000, but we get the exact same result. So we, in fact, any positive offer is going to lose an expectation. And the problem is I know what the car is worth and you do not. And even though we're in a situation where there surely is gains from trade, those gains from trade cannot be realized uh, because of this informational problem. And so, you know, one question you might have is, well, is there some way we could overcome this? And the answer is yes. And in fact, real markets do over, try to overcome this. And they overcome it by um, requiring that the, dis, that the seller disclose things about, that are adverse about value. If the engine doesn't work, uh, I can't say that it does. If the brakes don't work, I can't say that it does. So I have to disclose this stuff and the disclosure actually helps me and helps you um, because then there's less uncertainty about value. You have less exposure to the winner's curse, which in this setting we, 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 we uh, call adverse selection, um, but it's the exact same phenomenon. Um, and happens all the time. That term adverse selection comes from insurance actually, where it's a, it's a really serious problem in insurance. You know, who buys insurance? People that are likely to have claims. So it's the, you know, the, the, the guys that are just accident prone uh, that are gonna be more likely to have, to, to buy insurance. It's the unhealthy people that are gonna more likely buy health insurance. You, you know, all that's adverse selection, that's what, uh, an insurance company needs to correct for when pricing their uh, policies. And um, we've now developed lots of institutions. So for example, when um, we sold our house in Washington, DC uh, a few months ago, we had to disclose all the things that were wrong with the house and uh, th that we knew about. And that was, um, that's standard practice. And the um, uh, buyer is protected in the event that uh, something doesn't work that should have obviously, should, that, that we should have known about and we should have uh, disclosed. Um, so, you know, if there's some sort of leak or, or you know, what, whatever it is, the, the air conditioning system doesn't work, they're looking at it in the winter time, so they didn't try the air conditioner, but you know, all those things. And, and that, those sorts of market rule responses uh, then can overcome 
um, these challenges, um, this potential market failure. In this particular one, the, the used car, this was um, uh, studied and written up um, by George Akerlof, for which he got the Nobel Prize uh, many years ago. And it's very interesting because th his paper, um, he actually submitted it to 13 journals. So a sequence of, you have to do it one at a time. So a sequence of 13 journals, it kept getting rejected. Uh, this journal, that journal, all the journals were rejecting it. And then finally, um, Quarterly Journal of Economics accepted his paper. But then, you know, decades later, he gets the Nobel Prize because uh, it's you know, widely regarded as a, a very important paper, as well it should be. Um, but this idea of winner's curse um, was first studied in economics by Bob Wilson, who got the Nobel Prize two weeks ago um, for his famous paper in 67, uh, which actually looked at uh, the oil track problem and, uh, and found what the equilibrium behavior was in that circumstance where the winner's curse uh, is especially severe. But lots of other examples. Um, one of the most the largest ones that I was involved in was the uh, 3G auctions in Germany, uh, where the prices got built, bid up for the, the uh, 3G licenses to astronomical levels. Uh, the Mobilecom paid 8.5 billion euros for its license, paid the government the 8.5 billion euros. And then two years later, gave the licenses back and got you know, no compensation for them because they, 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 by rule, they weren't allowed to sell them. And they realized that rather than being worth well more than 8.5 billion, it was actually worth less than nothing uh, to them as Mobilecom uh, because they were the number five player in a market with very high fixed costs to provide service. And, uh, so, so that's you know, one very extreme instance of winner's curse. Now in the spectrum auctions, the guys have uh, experienced, and this happened right at the, the peak of the telecom and dot-com bubble in 2001. Um, but you know, since this event, folks have learned. So they're, they're, they're less uh, susceptible to it. But it is a very broad phenomenon, and it is something that you all, you know, whether you're you're working on theory or, or um, just dealing with practical life, uh, it's good to be acquainted with the winner's curse. Very, very real, very um, important to address, and quite subtle. So that's the thing why it's so uh, pervasive, is you think, well, there's more competition, so I should bid more aggressively. And so I should bid higher. You know, the fact that there's 16 bidders, I've got to bid more aggressively, which is what you all did. You, you shaded your bids very little between your estimate and your first price bid. But in fact, there's two forces. Yes, there's the competitive force, which means the more bidders there are, the more, the higher you want to bid. But then there's the winner's curse effect and the winner's curse effect is much, much stronger than the competitive effect. So in fact, as you add bidders, you wanna lower your bid, not raise it. And that's not intuitive to people. Uh, they think more competition, I need to bid more aggressively. Wrong, not if there's winner's curse. Okay, so now, um, what I want to do is take a break, and then we're going to come back and uh, do some math. So now we're going to, and, and actually we're going to start out in a situation where normally you'd use differential equations, but we're going to actually do it with a little bit of magic so we don't have to solve differential equations. Um, but let's take a 10-minute break, resume at uh, 25, it's 25 after the hour, let's resume at 25 till the hour. Um, so in 10 minutes from now, thank you very much.
Okay, welcome back. So what we're gonna do now is <clears throat> first look at the first price sealed bid auction and use that as a first example to figure out how to calculate equilibria in games with incomplete information. And then we'll uh, look at some other, another application, um, a bargaining application, and then finally we'll turn to uh, mechanism design. Although I suspect we won't get to the mechanism design part until uh, our third class. Okay, so uh, thinking about equilibrium first price auction, I'm gonna consider the absolute simplest case where I've got N bidders, each has an independent private value that's drawn from the same probability distribution F, and we now want to calculate what the equilibrium bidding strategy is. So optimizing that trade-off between the probability of winning and the profit that you get can conditional on winning. Um, so the first thing to do always is to write down the uh, objective function, which in this case is the profit function. And this is the simplest case. So the bidders are each going to have quasi-linear utility, which means that their utility is linear in money and the good. Uh, so risk neutrality. Um, so the profit that uh, a bidder gets depends upon their value and their bid, and, which is of course dependent upon their value. Um, and in particular, um, their profit conditional on winning is just value minus the their bid, I pay my bid in the first price auction, and I multiply that by the probability of winning conditional on their bid. Their probability of winning just depends upon their bid, doesn't depend upon their value. Um, but here, I've got a direct dependence on value. But otherwise, my profit function direct depends indirectly on my value through my bid both in the probability of winning and in the, um, the, the bid itself. <laughs> uh, so I can take the derivative, the total derivative of this. Let me do that. Um, so that would be the, um, the partial of profit with respect to bid times the partial of bid with respect to value. That's the, the indirect uh, component plus the partial of profit with respect to my value, the direct uh, dependence on profit and value. And now by the envelope theorem, this is just gonna equal to the partial of profit with respect to value. And the reason for that is that this term right here, the partial of profit with respect to my bid is gonna be zero in equilibrium. That is, I'm gonna be playing a best response that maximizes my profit. Uh, so I'm selecting my bid to maximize my profit. So this has to be uh, zero. And so that's why this whole term goes away. And so now, uh, what is the, uh, so, so, so the total derivative is the partial derivative, but the partial derivative is with respect to value, it's just the probability of win, right? Because it's value times probability of winning and the derivative of V is, is one and this doesn't directly depend on V. And so I just get the probability of winning. But in the symmetric, now let's impose the symmetry. Um, in the symmetric equilibrium, all the bidders are bidding the same function and B of V and so the, uh, you know, first of all, the winner is gonna be the guy with the highest bid. Okay, I haven't imposed the symmetry yet, but now the probability of the highest bid is the same as the probability of the highest value because your bid's gonna be increasing in your value and um, everybody's bidding the same bid function B of V. And so that's just F of V to the N minus one. Okay, because, the probability that my value is bigger than yours is F of V, 
the probability it's because of independence, the probability it's bigger than uh, yours and another person's is f of e squared. And so all the way up to n minus one, because I'm gonna be the highest when I'm higher than all of the n minus one others. And they're all independent draws. So we multiply those probability, those individual probabilities, f of v, uh, together to get f of v to the n minus one. Now, how can I use that? Well, now I know that the total derivative is equal to the partial derivative, and I know the probability of win is f of v. So now I can actually substitute um, those two results into um, the and, and, and solve for uh, b of v. Okay, recognizing that now I can get the probability. Uh, I'm sorry, the profit by integrating its derivative. And then this is just uh, linear in, in V. So I can, uh, or, or so, so I can solve for uh, the, the bid. And that's what I'm gonna do now. So fundamental theorem of calculus, I use the fact that the, the profit is just the derivative, uh, the partial derivative of uh, value. So I just, uh, integrate the uh, partial derivative in order to um, in order to get to the profit. So I integrate the total derivative, which is equal to integrating the profit, the, the, the partial derivative, which I was able to calculate. Um, here, the total derivative is equal to f of v to the n minus one. So that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's, it's, I know it up to a constant, but I know what this constant is. When I've got a value of zero, my profit's gonna be zero. There's no way I can make money with a value of zero. And so that simplifies to this. And now this is where I use the, the, what the definition of the profit is and solve for B of V. And then I can substitute in what the probability of win is and substitute in what um, uh, profit is to get this. Okay, so I bid my value minus something. That's the bid shading. And what is that shading? Well, it's just integrating um, f of u over f of v uh, to the n minus one for all u's between zero and v. So those are gonna be, that, that'll be a number that's, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be some number that's less than one. F of V is, so V is bigger than U for, for, for all of those uh, throughout that domain. And so uh, F of U over F of V is something that's less than one. I'm integrating, so it was a positive number, less than one, taking it to the N minus one and then integrating uh, from zero to one. So that's my, um, equilibrium bid function. And notice I didn't have to solve any differential equations. And that was sort of uh, trickery that normally you can't do. In general, what you need to do is um, just take the first order condition and set it equal to zero, which will be a differential equation uh, because your bid is a function of your value. And then you solve that differential equation, but in fact, there's n differential equations, one for each bidder, and so you solve that system of differential equations. And ideally, you've got symmetry, so you can um, uh, exploit that. But in this case, with symmetry, we don't actually have to um, solve any differential equations, which is nice. So here's an example, uniform distribution, the most famous one, which we use in pretty much all experiments. Um, so the distribution is just V, and then the optimal bid function is just uh, V times N minus one over N. So when there's uh, uh, two bidders, you bid half your value, three bidders, you bid two thirds your value, four bidders, three quarters your value, and so on, up to infinity where in fact you bid full value. So in the, in the limit, as the number of bidders grows to infinity, you bid your full value. But that's not what you do, that's because of independent private values where you know your value. If, you, if, if there's some common value elements, then you would wanna bid substantially less. <clears throat> okay, so that was one example. I wanna do um, 
the next example I want to do is more difficult. And the reason I'm doing this example is that then this will be a nice segue into mechanism design where we can do a general analysis that's going to apply to all bargaining problems and all auction problems and all public good problems, any game with incomplete information effectively. Um, so the situation now is going to be that we've got a, a, a single seller and a single buyer and they're engaged in trade. And the question is, you know, should they trade? And if so, at what price? And uh, this particular trading rule was studied by Chatterjee and Samuelson a long time ago, uh, back when I was a doctoral student, actually. And in fact, I played this very game with my office mate uh, by chance at the same time this paper was about to come out. It was a little before the paper came out, but I, I actually played this game with him because what um, we do in this, uh, this is uh, we make simultaneous offers and then it's uh, the split the difference trading rule. So we both make simultaneous offers. If the offers are compatible, the seller's offer is below the buyer's offer, then we trade and we, we split the difference. We trade at the, the midpoint, uh, halfway between what the seller's offering and the buyer's bid. Um, and that's very you know, simple, very nice. And so in fact, when my office mate, Denny Yao, who's, who's now a professor at uh, Harvard Business School, he, um, he actually saw my new edition of the um, micro theory text um, and he had the older edition and he wanted the new edition and he thought that, that he valued the new edition more than me. So he, so he asked me, you know, could we swap and then I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll pay you something because I know that, you know, the, the new edition's worth more to both of us, but I think it's worth more to me than it is to you. And so I said, okay, fine. You know, let's both write down a number, uh, write down our, our, our value on a piece of paper and compare them if yours is bigger than mine, then we'll trade and we'll trade it halfway between. Let's do that. You know, as it happened, this made sense because not only we were office mates, we were also um, apartment mates. So we were on friendly terms. We wanted to stay on friendly terms. So this seemed like uh, a good, simple way to resolve it. So we wrote down our numbers. Turns out we both wrote down $13. So we ended up trading. So I, he got the new edition, I got the old edition, and he paid me $13. Uh, And every, everybody was happy. Now, it'd be interesting to see what would happen if I wrote down 1350 and he wrote down uh, $13. Would, then our offers would be incompatible, but would I have said, okay, well, you know, it's okay. I'll just, uh, let's just trade at 1325. Well, if we were gonna do that, then in fact, this mech, the equilibrium analysis that I'm gonna do isn't, uh, uh, suitable because the, the you know we're this analysis assuming that we're committed to this mechanism so we were going to open this offer and we're going to follow the rules um, which is what we do in auctions you know generally we we always write down the rules and we follow the rules which is why auctions are such a beautiful instance of game theory because we actually have rules they're explicit uh, and we follow them in bargaining, that tends not to be the case. So most bargaining situations, the, the rules are not well-defined and, and um, often they're not written down at all. And then um, when people engage in specific rules, then they um, renege and do something else. That's sort of the beauty of negotiation is it's, it's flexibility. But it makes it, a, it's a very important problem, of course, in economics, bargaining comes up all the time, but it makes it a little bit harder for the economists to do the analysis with game theory because we tend not to have explicit rules. But here we're gonna have explicit rules. Um, and in fact, this is, my early work was all in bargaining and um, well, a little bit in auctions, but it was almost all in bargaining. And eventually I shifted out of bargaining because, um, it was, you know, it was fun. It was important, but the um, the game theoretic analysis explained only a fraction of what's going on. You know, I would say I 
would routinely say it explained about 20% of what was going on and then 80% was explained by factors that economists don't really understand. That was before there was the, the, the big uh, move in behavioral economics. You know, now I think economists understand a lot more than what they used to understand. Um, but back in, in the old days, uh, in the 80s, and uh, when I was doing uh, this bargaining work, um, uh, there wasn't much in the way of behavioral at the point at, at that point in time. Okay, so here's the setup. We've got uh, uh, two-sided incomplete information. The seller knows their value S, the buyer knows their value B, but neither knows the uh, value of the other, only the probability distribution from which it is drawn. So the seller's value is gonna be drawn from this distribution F, the buyer's value is drawn from this distribution G, both with interval supports. And again, we'll have <clears throat> quasi-linear utility. The seller's value is the price they receive minus their value in the event of trade and the buyer's payoff is the, uh, the value of the good to them minus the price of trade in the event that they trade. And of course, both get zero if they don't trade. So, so S is the seller's private information, B is the buyer, buyer's private information. The probability distributions are assumed to be common knowledge and the strategies in this game are going to be um, uh, a function P of S for the seller and Q of B for the buyer. Um, and what we would expect is this, uh, both of them to be increasing functions. So the higher your value, the higher your offer as seller and the higher your bid as a buyer. And the question is, what are the equilibrium uh, offer functions? That's what we wanna solve. Uh, it's independent private value. It would be nice if we found that the equilibrium was ex post efficient. That is we have trade if and only if uh, S is less than B. Uh, we'll find out that actually that's not the case, uh, typically. And, and that's the trading rule. We, uh, when we, we, if the offers are compatible, B is less than or equal to Q, we trade at halfway between um, P and Q. <clears throat> okay, first thing, we want to write down the objective for both seller and buyer. And we start with the, uh, we can start with the ex post payoffs and then, and then uh, integrate um, over what we don't know in, in order to calculate the, what I call the interim payoffs. Okay, so here's the ex post payoffs, zero if they don't trade, uh, P minus S for the seller and B minus P for the buyer in the event they do trade. Um, and they of course trade at halfway between. So those are the ex post payoffs. They're, um, what they're gonna to wanna to do is determine these offer functions to maximize their interim utility, which as I said, is taking the expectation over all possible Bs. So I'm, I'm, this is, I'm making my offer without any information about what your offer is or any knowledge of what your value is other than it's drawn from this probability of student G. And we're gonna assume for simplicity that F and G are um, independent uniform distributions on zero one. Okay, so that's just a simplification, which is gonna be nice. Uh, we can certainly do this analysis with a general distribution, but it would be um, um, harder to solve. As you'll see, this has a nice symmetry and I'm, I'm gonna be able to basically guess what the answer is, uh, which is gonna be nice. <clears throat> okay. So how do we do it? So, you know, first, what's the objective? Let's look at the seller's problem. Um, this, the seller, we're going to be integrating over buyer, all buyer types, um, but actually all for all the buyer types for which there's no trade, the payoff is zero, so I can ignore those. So I'm integrating over all buyer types for which there's trade. For which buyer types are there trade? Well, it's gonna be buyer types that their values are so high that they're making an offer that is above my offer P. 
Okay, so I want to actually be integrating. So, so if um, uh, y is the inverse of your offer function, so so you've got this increasing offer function q like this, and uh, so it's strictly increasing, so it's going to have an inverse. And I want to find the when I offer p, I want to find the b, uh, just inverting your. And so there's your 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 uh, b uh, that would uh, make the offer p. Uh, and so the b that makes the offer p is y of p. Okay, because y is q inverse. So q to the minus q inverse q of p is going to be uh, p. I'm sorry, q inverse q of b. No, I didn't mean to say p, I meant to say b. Uh, and so this y of p is going to be uh, the b, the type of buyer that uh, uh, I just barely accept and that is barely compatible with P, okay? This buyer type makes the offer P, we just accept that all others make higher and um, so that we're gonna trade in all those cases, what do we trade at? We trade at the split the difference price halfway between P and Q and I have to subtract out my value. Uh, that's going to be the gain that I get, my profit that I get from the playing this game. <clears throat> and that's what I want to maximize. So how do I do that? Well, I do what economists always do. Once you've written down the objective, you take the derivative with respect to your choice variable. Your choice variable is p, so I want to take the partial derivative with respect to take the derivatives with respect to p. And so with games of incomplete information, I'm typically doing this in this interim state uh, without knowledge of what the other guy's private information is. And so it's gonna be in involving the derivative of an integral. And I have to remember how to take the derivative of integrals. And you'll remember there's, in general, there's three possibilities. Um, the choice variable could appear in the upper limit could appear in the lower limit and it could appear in the integrand. And that's gonna to lead to three terms. And in fact, the derivative with respect to the choice variable P is gonna be the derivative of this with respect to P, which is zero. So that term goes away minus the derivative with respect to this, which is not zero, it does depend on P. Uh, it's gonna be, this is gonna be minus uh, Y prime P um, times the integrand evaluated at the lower limit. Okay, so I plug in y of p in here for b. So it's q of y of p, which is p. So it's p plus p, which is 2p divided by 2, which is p. So this is just going to be p minus s. Okay, so this term is minus y prime p, p minus times p minus s. And then the third term is the integral from lower to upper limit of the derivative of the integrand with respect to the choice variable. So I take the derivative of this with respect to P, which is one half, right? That's where the only place P appears. I've got this two here, so this is gonna be one half. So um, I'm integrating one half from uh, Y of P to one, which gives me one minus Y of P uh, times one half. And I set that equal to zero. Okay, so that's the first order condition, and that is uh, not so bad. And like I said, it's a differential equation. We need to solve that differential equation. But there's two players in this game. I got to do the same thing for the buyer. So I do the same thing for the buyer, but this time not in gory detail. Uh, we're going to get the exact same sort of thing. Uh, take the derivative with respect to the choice variable Q, set it equal to zero, and we get this. Okay, so now I've got my two differential equations. I want to solve that system of differential equations. And when you're solving systems of differential equations, there's always going to be um, uh, boundary conditions that get the thing started. And with two uh, differential equations, I'm going to need two boundary conditions in order to get this thing started. Um, so, but before I do that, let me uh, 
restate the uh, differential equations in a more convenient form by recognizing the, um, uh, the equilibrium condition. So once you've taken the derivatives, then you can impose things like symmetry or other equilibrium conditions. Um, in this case, the equilibrium condition is that um, x is p inverse, so x of p is equal to x, uh, y of q is equal to b. And so then I can go into um, these two equations, right, the two first order conditions and restate everything in terms of um, y's and p's and basically get rid of the s's and the, and the b's. <clears throat> Uh, which is fine. Now these Q's are just dummies, so so that 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 could you know that I could my dummy could be P here as well, um, and and then everything would be uh, I would have a, uh, um, the system of differential of first order differential equations, um, and then what I want to do is. I want to, rather than solving that, the way I solve this system is to substitute one into the other to get a single uh, equation uh, that then I can solve. So I'm gonna substitute two prime into one prime, uh, you know, changing these Q's to P's, which I can do, that's just a dummy. And then I substitute in um, and, you know, restating, because with from two prime, I, I can get uh, what uh, y of p is in terms of x and x prime. And once I know what y of p is, I can take the derivative to get y prime. And then I can plug into one prime and state everything in terms of uh, x's. So then I get a single differential equation uh, for x. It's a second order differential equation because it involves the derivative of x and the second derivative of x. And then I'm gonna have a single boundary condition that I need to substitute in to get going. Um, and then I just need to solve this differential equation. So you can look at it for a while and you can guess the easiest way to solve differential equations is to guess what the answer is. So here, let me take a wild guess. Let me guess that there's a linear solution. We had the uniform distribution. I chose the uniform distribution with risk neutral guys in the hopes that there would be a linear solution because I love linear solutions. So let me just guess that there is a linear solution. And that's the next step. So a linear solution would, would take this form and I just want to find are there constants alpha and beta um, that solve that and yes, there are, and that's what alpha and beta are. So it's just you know plugging in. Once I assume it's linear, I know what the derivative of x prime is, it's alpha and x double prime is zero. So now I can substitute into that monster here. You know, it looks like a monster, but once I assume it's linear, it turns into this uh, simple linear equation, which I can solve. And it has a unique solution. Um, and this is the unique solution. And then I can substitute that into two prime to get uh, y, which also has a unique solution. Um, and so, you know, that's great. And then I can invert it. This is the inverse of what I wanted. I wanted the offer function and this is the inverse. So I just have to invert a linear function, which is just a little bit of flipping and shuffling. And that gives me um, the, the linear solution, which is unique. So that's great. Um, so I solved the problem and uh, wonderful. Now let's look at it and see, because I might have made a mistake. So when I do these problems, I always uh, start first with my intuition. So, you know, what am I trying to do here? And um, do I have any intuition about the problem? And I actually do because I've, you know, studied enough. Uh, so, and I also, and then I start with the objective and make sure I get the objective right. But then I always go back and then check once I've got a result, you know, now I've got the answer supposedly. And 
I, I'm not done yet because I got to check to make sure that I didn't make a mistake somewhere. And the easiest way to identify a mistake is when you get something that looks really strange that you don't understand. And so in this case, let me look at it and see. Well, so what I've done is I've plotted, so this is the valuation space from zero to one for both seller and buyer. We're both from zero to one. And here's the 45 degree line, which would be bidding truthfully. And what's happening here, so this is, this is the equilibrium that I just calculated. So P of S and Q of B. And look what happens. They're, they're both linear, that's fine. And, but notice one thing that's interesting, that the seller is always overstating. They're not bidding the truth. They're overstating. And uh, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's what sellers do. Instinctively, that's what you should be thinking. The seller should be overstating and the buyer analogously should be understating. All right, because buyers like low prices, sellers like high prices and this split the difference trading mechanism, the higher price that I make as a seller, the higher offer I make as a seller, the higher price I will receive in the event of trade. And same thing for the buyer. So, so we've got a, a trading rule that uh, supports those very natural incentives uh, of sellers overstating and buyers understating. And that's exactly what happens. Now, one interesting thing here is when we get to this point, there is, he's telling the truth. Okay, the seller is telling the truth at this point. Well, how, why on earth would they be telling the truth? Don't they wanna make some money? Uh, and, the, and the answer is they're telling the truth because if they lied, the probability of trade would go to zero. They tell the truth when the buyers, at the highest possible buyer uh, bid. Okay, when the buyer's value is one, the buyer makes this bid right here. And only then does this uh, seller tell the truth. Because there's basically in this range, there's no trade. So, for all these seller types, there's no trade and there's nothing that the seller can do to make a profitable trade given the bid function of the buyer. And the same thing here, the buyer is always understating until this point where it bumps into the lowest possible seller offer. And at that point, you're, when you're balancing that trade-off between terms of trade and probability of trade, you, uh, uh, probability of trade has fallen to zero and there are no profitable trades for lower types. And so, you know, what you bid here doesn't matter. Uh, so, and in fact, these, it turns out, are the boundary conditions. We didn't have to uh, guess what the boundary conditions were because we, um, by assuming linearity, it turns out there's only, there's unique boundary conditions for the linear solution and it automatically spit them out. But the boundary condition is that uh, for the seller, um, I, I, actually, the, the, so the, the relevant boundary condition is this point here, actually, 0.75, which is the uh, highest buyer offer. And similarly, 0.25 is the other boundary conditions. And these, with those two boundary conditions, which would have been really hard for me to guess, but when I assume linearity, it spits them out. So I didn't have to guess them. Um, so unlike in the auctions where we had a natural boundary condition, when your value is zero, you bid zero. So, so that was a very natural boundary condition. You know, here the boundary condition is actually subtle and you, you, and in fact, it's not unique. And so in fact, the equilibrium isn't unique. It's only unique, there's only a unique linear equilibrium when I happen to guess 0.25 and 0.75 as the boundary conditions. Uh, otherwise, 
So if, if we, any other number along here, we're gonna get a nonlinear equilibrium. There will be an equilibrium. So, so in fact, and in fact, you only actually have to guess one number because there, because of the substitution, we, we, we got it down to a single, uh, single equation that we're solving. And so it's actually just the 0.25 that I have to guess here and then the 0.75 falls out automatically. And so if I raise this, what's gonna happen, so that would be the, the um, seller uh, shade, uh, exaggerating even more. Okay, so they're bidding more aggressively. And what happens then? So when, when I'm more aggressive, the best response of the buyer is to bid less aggressively. So they're gonna bid more conservatively. Um, and anyway, we get a whole continuum of equilibria here when we look at all the equilibria for this game. And that's actually kind of, that's not so bad. I mean, normally uh, theorists don't like games that have multiple equilibria because then, you know, what's the theory really telling us if there's multiple equilibria? Um, and in this case, what the theory is telling us is that in bargaining with uh, two-sided incomplete information, there's lots of equilibria and, equ and multiple equilibria is the norm. And in fact, when you play this game in the laboratory, what you get looks like uh, a snowstorm. Uh, there's dots all over the, I mean, it really looks like a uh, noise, uh, just dots all over the place. Um, and, the reason, the reason for that, so, you know, basically the theory isn't, isn't working out very well because there's lots of indeterminacy. And so it's just, you know, it's just not the case. I mean, obviously the subjects aren't solving differential equations to try to figure out how to bid. They are grappling with the basic intuition that sellers want to overstate and buyers want to understate. But, you know, beyond that, they're not, um, they're not able to, um, play optimally because they don't know what the other guy is doing. So it's it's not that surprising that the that the bids are all over the place. Now, you know, some theorists view, well, that then you've written down a bad game, but no, you, you have actually in bargaining, it's it's always going to be uh, indeterminate. Uh, unless you step in as a theorist and you write down a very, very special game. Uh, and only then can you get uniqueness. And then what's the point? You know, because people aren't even playing, uh, they aren't playing that game. Uh, when we're looking at bargaining, it's the bargaining is informal. And so we, it really wasn't alternating offers with five minutes between offers and, and or some other uh, uh, trading rule. It's totally unlike auctions where auctions were we're, we're, we actually are playing the actual game. And then as a market designer, it's nice to write down games. Now we can be a market designer in the bargaining environment and try to think of bargaining games that are, um, are very effective. And that's what mechanism design is going to enable us to do. So then we can take this trading environment and identify the trading game that uh, performs the best uh, in the particular environment. And that's what we're going to do uh, next. But first, I want to point out that this equilibrium is uh, inefficient. Uh, in, in fact, the only way to get efficiency here is if both seller and buyer told the truth all the time. That is, they bid right along the 45 degree line. But they're not doing that. Uh, sellers are overstating, buyers are understating. And as a result, we actually are only trading we're trading if and only if the gains from trade are at least one quarter. So we need, so we need the gains from trade to be large in order for trade to occur at all. So that's the inefficiency, and you know we, the conclusion might be well, okay. So Chatterjee and Samuelson thought of a stupid game to play, and so, you know. There, there's probably better games that we could play that would have much higher efficiency. So probably we should be playing one of those. Well, so far we don't have the technology to answer that question, but that's what we're gonna to turn to right now. 
is now we're going to ask the question, you know, was that a bad game? Or maybe it was actually a really good game and does quite well relative to alternative games they could be playing in this particular trading environment. So to do that, we need mechanism design. And mechanism design is closely aligned with market design. Uh, the distinction is mechanism design is a very powerful theory with which to analyze games with incomplete information. It gives us a general understanding of incentives in decision problems that involve private information. Um, so, and these are pervasive, bargaining, auctions, exchange, public good problems, all sorts of uh, settings where this is gonna be uh, important economic problems where we recognize that we don't have full information, that the private information is actually an important element uh, to analyze and mechanism design gives us a powerful way rather than looking at particular game forms and computing the equilibrium to a particular game form, we can look at the incentive prop more broadly. And that is going to be incredibly useful. So what I'm gonna do first is the exact same problem that, the, the, that Chatterjee and Samuelson were looking at, that is a single seller and a single buyer that are risk neutral, so quasi-linear utilities, the values are drawn independently um, from these known probability distributions, F and G, and they're gonna simultaneously make offers. Okay, so everything is the same, except for now I'm gonna do it uh, as a mechanism design problem. So rather than fixing a particular game form, I'm gonna have them play this revelation game where they report their types and then I'm going to look at the, I'm gonna characterize all the incentive compatible and individually rational trading rules. And that's going to be equivalent to effectively finding uh, all uh, outcomes that are consistent with Bayesian equilibria of some trading game between seller and buyer. So it's in that sense that this is uh, very general uh, looking at incentives. And uh, so in the direct revelation game, the seller and buyer are gonna make these reports and uh, of their, their values. And importantly, they're gonna be able to lie if they want to, but we're gonna design it so that they have, don't have an incentive to lie. And the motivation for that is the direct revelation principle uh, which states that in this particular class of environments, uh, we can limit attention to incentive compatible uh, mechanisms because every incentive compatible mechanism uh, in, in which players report the truth, uh, every uh, Bayesian equilibrium of every game with incomplete information is going to be consistent with some uh, incentive compatible mechanism in the direct revelation game. Um, so so that, that's why this, that this works. And the, what the mechanism is going to do is going to map these reports S and B into a probability of trade P and a terms of trade X. Uh, so P, little p is going to be the probability of trade X post probability of trade and little x is the X post uh, terms of trade. And our goal now is going to be to try to characterize um, incentive compatible, that is mechanisms that are, uh, that recognize the fact that, that, that folks have the ability to lie about their private information and individually rational, that is mechanisms that recognize that um, participants could decide not to participate so that participation is voluntary. And in, in uh, games with incomplete information, you know, certainly people can uh, misrepresent their private information and uh, they can decide 
not to participate. And so we want to uh, characterize equilibria that, that are both that satisfy both incentive compatibility and you know recognize the incentive to, to um, the opportunity to misrepresent and individually rational recognize that participation is voluntary. <clears throat> okay, so again, start with your ex post payoffs. That's the easiest thing. And here we've got the quasi linearity. So the ex post payoff is just for the seller, it's the, the payment from the buyer X minus uh, S times the probability they have to give the good up uh, to the buyer. And similarly for the buyer. So both traders are risk neutral. Well, and then we're, um, we're actually making our decisions, our, making our reports in this interim state before I know what the other player's private information is. So I need to take the expectation over all possible uh, types of the other. And it'll be convenient to split this into two. So here is the expected payment that the seller makes that the seller receives from the buyer, it's just integrating over all the buyer types. Buyers are, values are given by the distribution G. And here's the probability of trade from the seller's point of view in this interim state, integrating over all buyer types, the probability P of S comma V. And similarly for the buyer. Now, the reason I did that is because then we can conveniently write down what the, uh, the interim payoff is for seller and for buyer. And in particular, it's gonna be just XS minus S times PS for the seller and similarly for the buyer. Now, the thing to note here is that this is the interim payoffs are, are linear in um, value. Uh, for both seller and buyer. And that's gonna be very important and that's gonna lead to a very simple characterization of incentive compatible mechanisms. So in particular, I can restate, I, I, I can state incentive compatibility as, um, as follows, that the utility that I get from the mechanism when I report the truth, S, has to be greater or equal to what I get when I lie. And what do I get when I lie? Well, that's going to affect the term, the, the payment from the buyer. It's going to affect the probability of trade, uh, but it's not going to affect my actual value. So that S should not have a prime. So that's just that that's my true S uh, that, that I will lose in the event that we have uh, trade. And similarly for the buyer. So that's what incentive compatibility is. And now you can see um, how the incentive compatibility, you know, the fact that we had this linearity up here, it in terms of the payoff that I get when I lie, it's now it's going to be linear in the probability. It, it, uh, the payoff from lying is linear in my value. Uh, with a slope equal to the probability of minus the probability of trade for the buyer for the seller and plus the probability of trade for the um, buyer. Okay, and then individual rationality is that your interim payoff is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so so basically what we want to do is characterize all the mechanisms that are incentive compatible and individually rational. So the first thing we're going to do is incentive compatibility. And this is actually going to be super easy. And just because it's super easy doesn't mean it wasn't a big deal. When Meyerly, uh, when Merrilies first did this, he did it for uh, optimal taxation problem. And um, in 71, he got the Nobel Prize uh, later on. And Meyerson did this as well for, for auctions. And he got the Nobel Prize. So you, you, you get the Nobel Prize for doing really simple things almost always, 
it's just those really simple things have to um, be really important. And this is a good example of that. Okay, so, so all we have to do, and you can almost just stare at this and see it, that, that, that basically the, the linearity here of the uh, interim payoff from line, the fact that it's linear with slope minus P, uh, that means that the interim utility function is going to have these tangent lines, uh, supporting tangent lines underneath it with slope minus P for the seller and plus B for the buyer. And that's exactly what we're going to get in our um, uh, the derivative almost everywhere is minus the probability of trade uh, for the uh, seller plus the probability of trade for the buyer. And so we can get interim utility by integrating um, uh, the derivative uh, up to a constant. So we're going to get these expressions for uh, it, it, an incentive compatible mechanism um, where the probability of trade has to be decreasing in type for the seller and increasing for the buyer. So that's the characterization. And in the last four minutes, let me prove it. And then uh, we will finish the characterization uh, next class. <clears throat> okay, so, so, so I presented the intuition already. So I'll, we'll, we'll skip that. <clears throat> well, well, actually it's not, yeah, so, 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 so in essence, so, so this is, so do it formally, I can just um, uh, take the uh, definition of uh, in the interim utility and uh, then substitute it into incentive compatibility to get this, these inequalities. And then I combine those inequalities to show that I can uh, nest, uh, this difference in interim utilities between these two things, which when I take the limit as S prime goes to S, um, then is going to be minus the derivative of um, the probability of trade. So, so that says that the interim utility is has derivative minus the probability of trade almost everywhere for the seller and that then leads to the um, to this formula by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, that the, the function is the integral of its derivative up to a constant, and there's my constant. Okay, and we do the same thing for the buyer, of course, and. Then we have to do the other direction. And so here then I'm assuming I'm able to, it, it, uh, what I need to show is that for every S and S prime that uh, this inequality is gonna be satisfied. That's, that's incentive compatibility substituting in to the definition. Um, and I can simplify this um, quite a bit you know, these terms cancel and then uh, I just uh, simplify some more and I get this expression and, but, but let's look at this expression. Well, what do we know about this function P? Well, we've assumed we, uh, P has got to be decreasing. So since P is decreasing, whoops, then this inequality has to be satisfied. Okay, because then if uh, S prime, if, if S is bigger than S prime, then this would be uh, negative. We're integrating over positive domain. And so the thing's got to be negative or you know, weakly negative. Okay, and that's it, we're done. Um, 
Okay, finally, let's do the characterization of incentive individual rationality um, and combine it with incentive compatibility. So for an incentive compatible mechanism, we know that uh, we, so remember individual rationality means that everybody, every type wants to participate. That is U of S is greater than or equal to zero for all S. So here we, um, it's definitely, all we need to show is that this highest type seller wants to participate and the lowest buyer type want to participate because interim utility uh, is, is going to be decreasing for the seller and increasing for the buyer. So it's, if there's a, the guy that's benefiting least from the mechanism is always going to be the highest seller type and the lowest buyer type. And that's the full characterization of incentive compatible and individual rational mechanisms. And that is going to be it for today. We'll pick up from here and look at uh, mechanism design more broadly in our next class, which will take place tomorrow.